Stop looking for the perfect church. This is something that I have wrestled with. As many of you know, a lot of the time that I've spent on this channel has been dissecting and studying and synthesizing various theological perspectives in pursuit of the quote-unquote perfect church. And this is a well-intended um, pursuit, a well-intended endeavor. And I think so many people are spinning their wheels seeking for this, and they're looking, is this, is this the perfect expression? Is this the perfect church? Is this the true church? And what I have come to discover um, as an Anglican and in my journey is that, well, yes, we do need to place a high standard and a high priority on truth and on making sure that we are in continuity with the once-for-all apostolic deposit of faith that was handed to us. We also need to recognize that looking for the quote-unquote pure church or true church is ultimately going to leave us um, in a, in a state of, of sorrow. Um, I had the honor of talking with a priest friend of mine who really drove home to me the reality that the pure church doesn't exist. And those who seek to find it will always end disappointed. And I have found myself in this state of disappointment many times. I found myself looking, searching, trying to find this true church and being very frustrated why when I encounter the flaws and the 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 really the wounds and the scars and the evil and the junk and the heresy and the heterodoxy all wound up in these various church bodies and so it's very easy to be somewhere and to find a place within one of these denominations or communions. And then when you start to see all of this stuff, you immediately want to find it somewhere else. Because this can't be where the truth is if there's all these flaws. And what I want to propose to you is that if that's your mindset, which has been my mindset um, for a little while now. Um, it's been more recently that I've started to find a semblance of peace amidst the um, really the errors and problems within my own denomination. Being able to find this peace has really been rooted in, in first accepting that the pure church or the true church as a visible communion will never exist. Um, and does not exist. And the reason that this is important to acknowledge is because when we're so focused on looking for this pure church, we miss out on being able to behold the pure Savior, the bridegroom, the one who is spotless, the one who is blameless, the one who is perfect and pure. If we spend too long looking for the bride that's perfect, we're going to miss out on the groom who is himself perfection. And I have robbed myself of a lot of joy, a lot of peace in my soul by searching so hard and so desperately for the perfect church that I've missed out on being able to behold the face of my perfect Savior. And the encouragement that I want to offer in this video is really... So many of us, there is a there's a deep need within the human person to find something that is indefectible, right? We want something that is going to have an objectivity, a structure to it that is perfect, right? It's a word I've been using throughout this whole thing, perfect. But one of the things that I have in my study of this subject that I've looked into is when you go through the Old Testament and even up and through the New Testament, what you will see is that God's elect people, Israel and the church, when you see this covenant people as the plan of redemption has progressed, there's so much yuck, there's so much sin, there's so much wickedness. And not just wickedness and sin at the level of the quote-unquote laity, but sin and wickedness and evil on the part of the leaders. 
those who were called to lead the people of God in godliness and in truth, they are the ones who consistently fail to do so. They fail to live righteously. They fail to live in perfection, in holiness. And what's so amazing is is what this causes us, or, or should cause us to recognize, is that the plan of redemption came about through people, yes, but in spite of them, not because of them, in spite of them, in spite of the failures of wicked fallen man, God was the one who progressed his covenant plan of redemption for mankind. And so at the end of the day, when you look through the Old Testament and into the beauty of the incarnation and the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, we see that fallen man was used as the means by which God advanced this plan, but that the whole time it was God's faithfulness, God's righteousness, God's provision that ultimately brought the plan to fruition. It was not man. Man was failure, failure after failure, sin after sin, disobedience after disobedience, covenant unfaithfulness after covenant unfaithfulness. And so when you get to the new covenant, there's this idea that now we have the perfect church. Now we have the perfect thing, the perfect institution. But what we end up finding is that it's made up of fallen men, fallen women, just as it was before. Fallen leaders, fallen bishops, fallen priests, fallen deacons, fallen laity. And it is once again God who will advance his plan of redemption for humanity through this fallen body. And that's not to say that we should be denying or looking for um, an excuse to abandon the authority of the church. Christ has entrusted the church with the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit will preserve that apostolic deposit through the church. But we need to recognize that on a case-by-case individual level and even on an institutional level, the church has erred, the church will err. And we, we see this so clearly and so plainly in history. There are certain contexts where I believe that the church does not err. And I believe, you know, I would point to the creeds, I would point to the ecumenical councils as places where God's Holy Spirit promises to preserve the church and to preserve the truth. But that being said, I think that we, we should not even be looking to the ecumenical councils or the, um, or the creeds as the, the final source of truth and authority. We need to look to God alone and specifically to the scriptures as the, the revelation, the revealed revelation of God. Because the ecumenical councils, while they do possess an infallibility, their infallibility is derivative. It only, it, it only codifies and calls to mind those things which are already expounded in the revelation that God has given us in his word. And so the only new revelation that we have, the only true revelation from God is contained in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so when we look to these things and we look to the church as the interpreter of these things, we must recognize the church has an authority in this sense, but not in the sense of being this undefiled, pure, spotless thing. That alone belongs to Christ and he is taking his church and he is sanctifying his church so that his church will be that spotless pure virgin before him but we're not sanctified yet we're not fully sanctified in a consummate eschatological sense that still is to come and that's why we bend on our knees and we say Lord Jesus Christ son of God have mercy on me a sinner because we recognize that we are a work in progress we are saved we are being saved we will be saved and not only is this on an individual level it's on a more importantly a corporate level God Jesus the pure and spotless Lamb of God is perfecting his spotted, flawed bride that he has decided to marry himself to. And so, yes, honor the church, revere the church, elevate the church. And yes, there is a visible reality to the church, and there are those who are outside of it, and there are are those who are inside of it. But within that visible body, 
If we're looking for perfection, we are not going to find it. If we're looking for sinlessness, we're not going to find it. We will always be disappointed. And so my encouragement to you and the encouragement I've found in the Anglican denomination I'm in is I have all of that which I believe to be apostolic, the apostolic deposit of faith. But mixed in with that is sin. Mixed in with that is error. Mixed in with that is flawed people. And I'm one of them. And so if I point my finger at somebody and say, ah, you're so flawed, I better turn that around and point it at me and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. So let's not idolize the ideal of the pure church. Let's idolize, let's venerate, let's honor, let's worship the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if we start there, I do believe that the church will become more clearly and more visibly a pure and spotless bride. But until we stop introspecting about ourselves and start beholding the face of our Savior, I'm not sure how much further we'll get in our sanctification because we are not the means of our sanctification. That's Christ alone. So if we're not looking at at him, if we're not beholding his face, then what exactly are we looking to? What exactly are we putting our faith in? These are the things I've asked myself. These are the things I'm asking you. I challenge you to look at your Savior, behold his face, and see the church for what she is and for what she will be through the sanctifying grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.